Good afternoon, and welcome to this week's episode of Ask Dr. Murphy. I hope everyone is doing well today. My name is Katie Berg. I'm a research study coordinator with the Havey Institute, and I'll be leading today's discussion. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy. Dr. Murphy, how are you today? Doing quite well. Thank you. Dr. Robert Murphy is the Executive Director of the Havey Institute for Global Health and the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. He answers your COVID, infectious disease, and public health questions each week here on the Havey Institute for Global Health's Facebook page. Today, Dr. Murphy will be addressing and answering viewer submitted questions, as well as the latest headlines and our lone U.S. COVID statistic through today, September 3rd. We invite you to submit any questions or suggested topics down below via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health or by email at globalhealthinstitute at northwestern.edu. Starting with the COVID statistic, average COVID deaths per day reach 108 daily. The same week in 2023, we saw 131. Dr. Murphy, your reaction? Well, it's the number hasn't changed for the last uh, two weeks. Uh, in other words, being over 100 per day, that corresponds to approximately 40,000 deaths per year um, that otherwise wouldn't be happening. Uh, it's a little better than it was in 2023, but it's still pretty high. So we're still at this high level. The wastewater is still showing very high levels uh, around the United States and many parts of the world. So we're, we're, peak, we're, we're still at the summer peak. So, you know, hopefully what we'll see is the uh, uh, wastewater go down and then the deaths will go down. The deaths will be the last thing to go down. They're the last to go up, the last to go down. Mm -hmm. And going to our questions for this week, the first one, one that we get often, is what order should you look to receive the upcoming COVID and flu vaccinations? Yeah, that's a good practical question. Uh, it doesn't really make any difference. And you can actually take them at the same time. Uh, there is some slight advantage to, of taking the uh, COVID and flu vaccine at the same time. A little study that was done uh, several months ago, uh, and it showed that when you take them on the same day, the COVID um, antibodies that are produced are higher than when they're taken apart. So uh, that translates typically into a better response, um, but it's a little bit of an indirect marker. But regardless, you can take it if it's convenient for you, just take them on the same day. Mm -hmm. Now, our next question is in response to one of the stories, research articles we covered last week. The mm -hmm. viewer asks, can you first, when you answer, can you please tell us a little bit about what the study is so we can remember, but they ask, Having the COVID vaccine only decreases hospitalization by 4%. Can you help me understand this? Was this yeah. something that we plucked out of nowhere or where did that come from? Well, this is um, um, really uh, not about the vaccine efficacy. It was uh, really about the effect of the EG5, vac uh, EG5 virus, which came bef before the JN1. So we're in the, the JN1 family right now. And before that was the EG5. And uh, really all they, what they are saying here is that the EG5 had more hospitalizations associated um, uh, with, uh, with people getting infected, whether they had the vaccine or not. Um, and so this difference, uh, although it's only 4%, is real. It's uh, statistically significant because they looked at so many different uh, uh, people vaccinated and unvaccinated. So um, it, it's just uh, it's just proving that the EG5 was more virulent. It was it was a a stronger uh, virus. The JN1 is uh, is a slightly uh, weaker virus. That that's all that's saying. Mm -hmm. Anything to do it with really vaccine efficacy or anything like that? It's really about the virus. The JN1 is less dangerous. Mm -hmm. And it really points out why we need these new vaccine formulations each year, like with the flu, with a, right. a virus that's changing so quickly. Yeah, I mean, uh, the vaccine that is out now, um, we're going to talk about uh, the Novavax approval in a minute, but uh, the uh, Pfizer and Moderna 
uh, mRNA vaccines are geared towards the uh, JN1 uh, and and further uh, uh, evolved uh, viruses. Mm -hmm. Now, our next question comes from a new viewer who asks, has this channel addressed IgG4 and the ongoing studies surrounding it? First, can you tell me what IgG4 is, what it has to potentially do with COVID, and yeah, just explain what's going on with that. It's uh, it's just a class of antibodies, uh, and it they have been associated um, with people with immunologic disorders. In other words, uh, an antibody can sometimes actually be associated with problems, um, and so the in in this uh, study that is being referred to here, that uh, after the vaccines, some patients were noticed to have increased uh, levels of IgG4, kind of an unusual finding, uh, but it was real. And if you look at those patients that actually had that level, levels increase. First of all, we don't know this, the actual significance of having a vaccine-induced increase, uh, what that really means. However, these people were much older and had multiple underlying diseases. So it's probably a constellation of factors that are having this antibody be uh, slightly, but significantly increased. So older and uh, sicker, more genetically susceptible uh, people. So it's it's not an across the board phenomenon. Let's mm -hmm. put it. Uh, and historically, that group has been most affected by COVID nineteen infection right. itself. They're the ones who need the vaccine the most, and you know as as. The population gets herd immunity. The, the only people getting hospitalized and uh, and dying from this disease are the most old uh, residents and uh, uh, with the most underlying diseases. Mm -hmm. They need it the and most, regardless. Absolutely, of IgG four or not, you know. So it really doesn't make too much difference. And on the topic of these COVID vaccines, you mentioned it a little bit, but we just got an approval for the Novavax COVID vaccine. Can you tell us a little bit about it and why the approval was a bit later than the other two? Well, the the uh, Novavax, Novavax vaccine is made in the traditional methods of, of vaccines, whereas the mRNA is a newer technology. It's quicker, more nimble. You can change the formula much easier. Um, I mean, that's why we had vaccines available in December of 2020, even though the you know, it wasn't even a year before the virus was identified. Um, that never would have happened with the uh, uh, manufacturing process, the old protein-based uh, process that Novavax uses. Um, both both types of uh, vaccines work. Uh, Novavax works just well, but it's not quite as nimble uh, in the manufacturing process. So they started making their uh, vaccine um, right away uh, when the uh, uh, the season was, uh, uh, it was predicted that these JN1 variants uh, were going to be out there. So um, they, they focused on JN1 and then the mRNA vaccine took um, uh, mutants that were a little bit further down the, the food chain from JN1 and they switched their formulation you know, at the last minute. And uh, so it, it's a little bit more updated, but it's in the same family. Uh, so it's probably not going to really make uh, any difference in terms of efficacy uh, in this case. So anyhow, Novavax is approved. Um, it's a slightly different, um, uh, they're all, all the vaccines are slightly different, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it is uh, uh, slightly different from the um, mRNA vaccines with Pfizer and Moderna, which are looking at these uh, KP2 um, and other KP3 subvariants of JN1. So <laughs> probably confusing everybody with this, but uh, they're all going to work. They're all going to probably work the same. Mm -hmm. And of note, the Novavax vaccine was approved for those 12 and older, or it's either 12 or 11 and older, while the mRNA vaccines are approved for those much younger. That's so it. something to keep up for if you have, yeah, six and months, if you have young ones. 
right? That's just due to how they did their original studies. You know, it's not that it wouldn't work in younger children, but um, they didn't study that. So, you know, they get the approval for what they did the studies for. Mm -hmm. And switching gears to H5N1, the avian flu, we've had a couple weeks off of coverage in major news, but there has been some this in last week. Can you give us an update on the avian flu here in the U.S.? Yeah, um, New Mexico uh, reported uh, some other cases of avian flu um, in uh, cattle and dairy cows. Um, and so that brings us up to a total of 194 infected herds uh, in 13 different U.S. states. Um, they have those herds are responsible for infecting 14 um, health, uh, 14 dairy farm workers, um, and none of them have died. Uh, they've all survived. That's great. Um, the in the poultry world, on the other hand, over a hundred million domestic animals, primarily birds, chickens, and turkeys and the like, have been infected and have been culled. I mean, they've been killed and buried. Um, and that's in 48 states and 51, a total of 51 jurisdictions overall. So um, it, it it's devastating in the, the animal world. And fortunately, it has not been able to uh, transmit easily person to person. Mm -hmm something we will keep our eyes on to see if those numbers oh, yeah. continue to grow. Mm -hmm. But another topic that we have not taken a week off of because of its prevalence is MPOX and the outbreaks and the process of getting vaccines approved globally. I understand there's been some news here in the U.S. and on the global front. Can you fill I us think in? Are, things are starting to move. Uh, they, they started really a couple of weeks ago. Um, but in 2024, there have been over 20,000 MPOX cases due to clade one and clade two reported from 13 African countries. This has resulted in over 600 deaths. Uh, and just last week, there were over 4,000 cases reported between these both of these strains. Um, so the clade one was the one originally in Africa, rodents to man. And then clade two was the one primarily uh, sexually transmitted. Uh, and was uh, less serious. There are fewer deaths reported with clade two. Um, in Congo alone, Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, almost 20,000 cases have been reported with 629 deaths just in that country. Um, but it's uh, pretty much all over Africa now, 13 countries reporting. And, um, you know, there was a big delay. There's, there's treatment. There are vaccines and there's a multiple different kinds of vaccines. And, you know, in in some of the uh, low and middle income countries, you know, they don't they have to wait for WHO to give the final approval before they can get unit uh, a UNICEF and uh, Gavi and these other international organizations to be distributing the vaccines. Now, Congo in particular, where most of this is happening, has has approved many of these vaccines. And so it's it's legal to for donors such as the United States or France or, or uh, European uh, Union they can they can do the donations right now, but the big um, distribution is going to come when WHO uh, gives the final approval and they are getting ready. So um, there's hundreds of thousands of doses already on the way over. Uh, and, uh, for instance, the um, uh, UNICEF uh, uh, just last uh, weekend <clears throat> uh, issued uh, an emergency tender to uh, secure vaccines and coordinate with Gavi and the African CDC, PAHO, which is the Latin America and WHO. And uh, they are set up, once the donations start coming in, to... Um, purchase and distribute uh, up to 12 million doses by the end of next year. So it's it's just all happening now, finally. And uh, I think the final T's will be crossed and I's will be dotted uh, in just a, a matter of a very short period of time. And stuff is already starting to move. 
Mm -hmm. It's great news to hear that stuff is moving. Yeah. But a topic that was new to me is Eastern equine encephalitis. Virus. There were reports, a virus, excuse me. There were reports of a death from the virus this year in the United States. Can you tell us about the virus itself and where yeah, it is? So this is a virus referred to as EEE, -E -E, equine, Eastern equine encephalitis virus. It's pretty rare, uh, but it's very serious. Um, and it's reported in Eastern and Gulf Coast states. Uh, cases have come in this year from New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Vermont, and Wisconsin. Um, there's no vaccine or antiviral um, uh, treatment available. Uh, there's typically around 11 cases per year, so it's, it's, it's not very common. Um, there were seven cases last year, but uh, in 2019, there were 30. And of those 30, 12 of them died. So it's up to a 30% um, mortality. And so the, what they, um, um, uh, the five cases this year came from the states I already mentioned, and the one case in New Hampshire that has passed away. So it's just another unfortunate mosquito transmitted virus that can be very serious. Fortunately, it's very rare. But in the states that are, are finding it in the mosquitoes or where the patients are um, being identified, um, you know, they're closing parks and areas of, of uh, uh, geographic areas, warning people not to go there uh, and come in contact with any kind of mosquitoes. Because all you can do is wear mosquito repellent and, you know, uh, wear clothing that covers your body and mm -hmm. just getting bit by mosquitoes. Absolutely. Our final story today is a quick update on the listeria outbreaks that we were seeing linked to deli meat. Can you tell us about the new news? Yeah, this is uh, very unfortunate. There were 14 additional cases uh, um, uh, reported. So the total now is 57, uh, with nine of those people dying from lister listerosis, uh, listeriosis. So this is all from these infected deli meats from Boar's Head Meat Company. People have probably seen it in the grocery store and stuff. And uh, at least one of the plants that they uh, uh, were processing the food have been cited for violations in health codes and has been shut down. There's been recalls of many of their products. Um, and especially if they're uh, they have certain code numbers like EST one two six one two or P one two six one two on the uh, USDA inspection sticker, and um, you know it's it's really it's just very unfortunate, and uh, you know it's linked to this uh, one source, uh, and it's caused all this havoc and. Uh, the age range of the patients is 32 to 95 years of age. So all sorts of people. Um, and uh, of the 57 patients uh, reported this year, 17 were in New York State, eight in Maryland, um, and uh, five in New Jersey. Um, it just, uh, and 18 states altogether have uh, reported these cases because the food get, moves around so much. Uh, in the uh, whole uh, food chain system. So it's just an uh, just an unfortunate, very unfortunate problem that was preventable. Mm -hmm. Very, very unfortunate news. And thank you, Dr. Murphy, for sharing with us, breaking it down and keeping us aware of all that's going on in the world. It's much appreciated. Okay, well, thank you. Have a great week. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Ask Dr. Murphy series. We hope to see you again next week. And as always, if you have any questions or suggested topics you would like Dr. Murphy to address, please leave them down in the comments below or any of our social media linked in the description. Have a great week.